How many are hungry for God's Word today? Are y'all ready for God's Word? I want you to open your Bible to the book of Romans chapter 8. Now, last week we, we were in Romans 8, huh? Weren't we somewhere around in there? <laughs> Romans chapter 8. And we are going to be looking at verses 1 on down to 11. The title of my message this morning is No Condemnation. No Condemnation. Look at this in verse 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. I'm going to stop right here. Now, one of the things that happens for us as human beings is whether we realize it or not, before we live, before we give our life to God, um, there is a sense. And I and I want to just say this the right way. And I, I hope everybody understands this. People are walking around whether they realize it or not having already been condemned. Now, you're not, not going to hear this a lot in churches, but I want to say this to you. Keep your finger at Romans chapter 1 and then go to John chapter 3. And I want you to look at verse 17. Let's look at verse 16. You all know this. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You can't stop at that verse, though. Look at the next verse. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned what, y'all? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And look at verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were what, y'all? For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be what? Exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that the de- that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So now let's go back to Romans chapter 8, and look at verse 1. There is therefore now, that's why I said now and I emphasized that before, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So we start here, and we understand that condemnation, whether people are realize it or not, is already resting on people. As it pertains to their relationship with God, there is a void, and the void in the relationship is there because all of us were born into sin, all of us were shaped in iniquity, and our nature is flawed. Before we know the Lord, our nature is flawed, and it puts us at enmity against God. And as a result of that, God, there is a our, our condition has placed us in a position of condemnation. Our actions from that position ver, uh, further submit, cement that judgment. And we walk around sometimes feeling rejected as it pertains to God. And we don't always know why. Like, I don't want to go to church. You know, the, the good people go to church. People that, you know, they do the holy thing. I don't want to sing those songs. That's Christian stuff. 
And what happens is, is that people are walking around with this sense of rejection from God and condemnation, and sometimes they don't really know how to articulate it and understand it. And for us, it's important that we realize that just because we're, we're in a position of condemnation does not mean that God does not love us. There's a desire for the connection to take place. We have to receive it and not only receive it, understand the means by which God has given us to reestablish the connection. To establish the connection. You cannot have the connection your way. We have to meet God on his terms so that we can establish the connection. And that condemnation lifts off of us. A lot of times we want God to meet us our way. But we have to understand the great judge of the universe. He's the one who, sta- who, who determines the terms and conditions. We don't as human beings. So we have to meet him at the position and place that he's ordained and, de- and designed for us. And in meeting him, God will come in and he'll lift the condemnation off of us and the guilt and the shame and the things that come along with that condemnation. People are walking in it. So in order to, to ease their conscience, what do they do? They pop some more pills. They drink a little bit more of this. And they, or they go, they, they try to fulfill it with a bunch of stuff. Maybe if I party some more, I can feel better. Maybe if I go on another vacation. Maybe if I, po- I, I just post some more stuff on Facebook and it'll make me feel better about it. Maybe if I dress up all the outside, and I'll, I'll feel better about myself. Maybe if I tuck this or pluck this, I'll, it'll make me feel better. And so people are always groping for that acceptance and satisfaction and, and, and feeling better about themselves, not understanding part of the reason why you feel bad is because you haven't connected with God. And he's the only one that can ease your conscience from your decisions and your condition and bring you into a place where that condemnation lifts off of you and you really do have peace in your heart in your mind and in your heart. You may not have all the money. You may not have all the stuff. You may not have all the relationships and the cars, but you have peace between you and God, which causes you to live a lifestyle of peace. Well, what happens for a lot of people, they're walking around feeling this condemnation, and they don't know how to get it lifted. But this is what he says in verse Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in who, y'all? Christ. So now God, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has given me access to a new source of life. The old Adam caused me to die, but the new Adam, Christ, has caused me to live. And he lifts the condemnation and guilt and shame upon me, off of me. Why? He's able to do it because he was not only the price that was paid for my sin, he was a price that was necessary. It was the only price that could uh, free me from the guilt and shame of my past. It was the only price that was acceptable to God. And as a result of that, when you receive the Lord into your life, He not only forgives you of your sins, but he gives you a new source of life. Your life is not found in the old Adam anymore, meaning your nature. He has given you the divine nature, and he's caused you to begin to reflect him in the earth. And what does it do? It lifts the condemnation because the old you is dead so that the new you may come alive. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. This word here, condemnation, it means to condemn. It means a decision against someone, a condemnatory judgment. The synonym of this means the verdict or sentence pronounced. So people don't realize it, that they're walking around And they're already in a position of judgment because they do not believe. 
The sentence has already been given because they do not believe. Well, you lift that off of you through connecting with Christ and receiving the price that was paid and the price that was necessary. And then what does God do? He frees you. This is the problem that we have. I sit down and I talk to Muslims. I say, hey, man, so you guys, this is what you guys believe? Yeah, they come to me, want to talk. And, oh, I heard you're a pastor. Yeah, blah, blah. So I'm listening to them. And the question that I ask them is this. Okay, I heard all this stuff, right? What about your sin? Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for it? Mohammed didn't pay for it, did he? Who's going to pay for that? Well, I'm just trusting that Allah is going to be merciful. No, if he's a just judge, then he has to render verdict and be fair and just according to the rules and the laws that have been established. So tell me this. How, so you telling me that it's okay for you to do all this stuff I see you doing, but then it's okay. Who's going to pay for that sin? Buddha, who's going to pay for that sin? Joseph Smith, who's going to pay for that sin? Somebody got to pay. A judge wouldn't be just if he just let you off the hook for how you just destroyed this person's life, that person's life, that person's life, that person's life. You did this, and then not only that, you destroyed your temple, all this other stuff that happened. Who's going to pay for that? A lot of times there's not an answer. It's, oh, it's going to be merciful. My, my thing is, you better hope he is. Because somebody got to pay. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He was the propitiation. He was the price that was paid, the price that was necessary to appease God's wrath against hum humanity. He's the only sacrifice that is acceptable to the Father, the God of the universe, to appease his wrath. He not only, now this is the thing that is beautiful. He not only has forgiven you his, your sins, but then he turns around and he allows you to become like him so that you don't continue in sin. And we're going to talk about that as we get down in here. But this is the thing that is a beautiful thing is when you start thinking about God's mind and what he's done for you. That your sins matter, but God knew how to deal with them. A man could not appease his wrath. It took God to please God to appease his wrath. And as a result of him being the price that was necessary... And the price that was paid, if when you get in him, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things, all things have become new. When Noah and his family got in the ark, and all everything started falling around, falling apart all around them, they were in the, the safe place of security that caused them to be sustained through, through the storms and the waves and the winds that beat. For us, we have to see how beautiful and how powerful it is that Jesus is the price that was paid. He was the price that was necessary to appease God's wrath. And as long as I stay in him, then I find myself in a position of safety, and there's therefore now no condemnation as I rest in him. But he doesn't just say be, that we're in Christ. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now watch here, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So now this is the thing that is beautiful, because Christ doesn't just forgive you of your sins. I just said it. He transforms you into his image and likeness from glory to glory. Understand that. 
You don't just want your sins to be forgiven. You want to be changed. Can I have an amen, y'all? I don't want just that. I want my sins to be forgiven, but I don't just want my sins to be forgiven. I don't want to keep doing it. I need to be changed. Well, Jesus comes in and he teaches us how to walk in the spirit so that we do not fulfill the lustful desires of our flesh. Our old nature, he takes, he takes the power away from our old nature, infuses within you a new nature, and then gives you the ability to become like him from the inside out, y'all. He gives you the fruit of his spirit. Man, I feel the anointing on this. He gives you the fruit of the spirit. He gives you his divine nature. He causes you to walk like him from the inside out, and you're transformed into his image. Well, what happens is, is that when we do this condemnation, it, it, it has to lift off you. Condemnation has to get off you. When you start living like the new Adam, condemnation has to get off you. It has to, it has to loose you. It has to, it, it, you, it starts to, the, the God through his spirit begins to start pushing the condemnation off of you. And then people walk around in their relationship with God. It's not faked or contrived. Paul said that by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but Christ who was in me. What happens is now you start to live out the realities of Christ's nature within you and the condemnation has to lift because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And this is how we begin to live. We begin to live. You start to live free from the guilt and the shame of your past and the condemnation that has come as a result of that. You start seeing yourself as accepted in the beloved. You're not trying to earn it. You've already received it. It's resident within you. And then now this just becomes your lifestyle. So when it comes to God, he's not distant or foreign. But he has come nigh to you. He's come near you. And then now you feel God in your spirit. You feel God in your life. And you can feel the divine smile over your life now. And you're not walking around with condemnation all the time. The devil can come along and he can try to remind you of your past. The devil can come along and try to tell me, tell you you're still guilty. But when you have this revelation, it helps to push back the, the condemnation. And you, because you know who you are in God, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You're able to quote the scripture and the devil doesn't know what to do with that. Get that condemnation off your life. Get the condemnation. Get the guilt and the shame off your life. And start reminding your, yourself who you are in God. Now, if there's something that you need to repent of, that you need to get right with God, if we confess our sin, then God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're still in the process. We're still on the potter's wheel. But we know how to get that condemnation and guilt off us also by not hiding like Adam did in the garden. But we expose it. We bring it to the light. Those are in the light. They come. Didn't know what he said over here. He said they come to the light. But men hate light rather than dark. Uh, they, they, they hate uh, they, they love uh, darkness rather than light. Men love darkness rather than light. But the person who is. In the truth, they come to the light. If you're in the truth, I'm, not, I'm coming to the truth, man. It was me. I messed up, Lord. I'm confessing my sin. I'm not going to blame it on her, blame it on him, blame it on them. Blame it. That was me. I need God. I need help. There was me. I need. I'm not covering nothing. I ain't covering nothing. I ain't covering nothing up. I want to bring it to the open. I want to get this right. I don't want no condemnation. Can I have an amen, y'all? This is how we start to live. And so he says there is therefore now... No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We want to be in him and who do not walk according to the flesh, but we walk according to the spirit. We allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, not our old sinful nature. Look at verse 2, because this is a legal issue. 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and what, y'all? Death. So we have to see it is a legal issue. But the devil, he is a legalist. He knows that if you don't know what I'm telling you right now, then he can still impose his condemnation, guilt, and shame over you from something you did 30 years ago. They don't, they, 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 they're biblically illiterate. They don't understand it, that they've already been free, but they don't, they don't, I'm just going to keep on badgering them. But when you know the law, then you can be a law enforcer. And in some cases, you have to be, you have to tell the devil to shut up because you know your rights. Can I have it? Amen. I know what Jesus did for me, and I know how, what his blood does matter and the power that the blood has to cleanse my conscience from all my past works and all the things that I did that were sinful in my life. I know that Jesus' blood was powerful enough to cleanse and to wash me and to heal me and to deliver me and to free me and to bring me forth as a new person in Christ. And I don't care what you say about my past because the old Napoleon Coffin is dead. You you can talk about them all you want, but it means absolutely nothing to me because I'm a new man in Christ. I just feel the anointing on this. Somebody needs to hear that this morning, that you're new in Christ and you have to know the law. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. The old covenant, the law of Moses, was a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. It was, there, the law in itself was not bad. It was just not complete. The law of Moses was great from a ceremonial standpoint, from a civil standpoint. And, <clears throat> and understand that the law in itself wasn't bad. It just did not supply the power that we needed to change. It told us that we were wrong. It told us that it reminded us and awakened our consciousness to righteousness and God's holy standard. But it never infused the people that read it with the power, with the power to live up to the standard. So that's why there was a day of atonement every year so that there were people were reminded. And it was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Christ does not make us lawless. He, he's, he doesn't make us lawless. The difference is Christ tells us, thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal, thou shall not. He tells us not to do those things, and he says, but I'm going to one-up you on it. I'm going to give you power so you don't do it. The law was weak towards the flesh. It did not have the power and the strength to give us what we needed. It was just a reminder until Christ came. And then once the, once the law saw Christ, the law handed us over to Christ and said, this is a better deal for you. Because now you're going to be reminded of your sin, but then you're going to have power now to overcome it. And so this is what he says in verse Two, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. He says in verse 3, he explains it. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin, where y'all? In the flesh. Jesus lived a perfectly perfect, sinless life. He was born of the Spirit. He was placed. You guys want to go a little deeper? Are y'all sure? Is this too much? The Bible says that in Adam all die. Understand that 
when Adam died, we all died because we were in Adam. No matter what color you are. That's why I get, I, it irritates me when I hear people, they just, they, uh, they worship their ethnicity. I talked about this last week. I respect and I thank God for my ethnicity and the people that God, the genealogy that God has allowed me to come through. But understand, we have to understand that when it comes to tracing back to your lineage, you have to trace your lineage all the way back to Adam. When he sinned, we all sin. Now, the thing that is so powerful is that when Mary, the Bible says that she had a child that was born of the Spirit. She, understand that when it came to the life and the essence of who Christ was, he partook of human nature or humanity. He partook of humanity. But this seed did not come from a man. This seed did not come from a man. And because it did not come from a man, it did not have man's what? Nature. God, he found the incubator. He found the incubator. But the incubator, but it, but it already had it had the divine nature. That's the difference. Understand that Jesus had a human experience, but he, from a nature standpoint, was not human. He did not have the flawed nature that we have. He wasn't in Adam. Can I have an amen? He wasn't in Adam. We were in Adam, but he had an earthly experience in this human shell. And by the power of God upon him, he lived a sinless, perfect life. And, now watch this, y'all. And he yielded to, he fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. Died condemned sin in the flesh, rose again on the third day, and is now sitting on the right hand of the Father as you and I's kinsman redeemer. Understand. So when, we, when we're thinking about this, now the same Christ who got in the earth and shell overcame the, the human experience lived a sinless and perfect life, that same Christ has now living where, y'all? The same power that he used to overcome and the human experience is the same power that I use now to overcome in my human experience. I walk in the spirit. Can I have an amen? Don't walk in the flesh. Don't, you have a dual nature that's in you now. And you, and you have a Jacob and you got an Esau. And every day you got to fight. You got to fight the old you so that the new you can reign on the inside of you. And as a result of that, you start to live your life from the inside out at a different vantage point. You, you, you're having the earthly experience. You understand what your flesh is all about. But every day, you're denying yourself, 
you're taking up your cross, and you're following him, and the old Napoleon is dying every single day, and the new Napoleon is emerging. And when he comes out, he's not looking the same way the old Napoleon Kaufman did. He's got a lot more love. He's got a lot more joy. He's got a lot more peace. He's got a lot more patience. He's got a lot more goodness. He got a lot more forgiveness. He's got a lot more mercy. He got a lot more kind. Can I have an amen? That he starts coming out of you. And when he starts coming out, you got to let him out. I got saved and I, I wasn't a big crier growing up, but I got saved. And I got saved and I started getting around the church. And every Sunday I'm crying. I'm like, man, you soft, man. What's happening to you? Soft, man. You crying over everything. You walking out. You just see a bee and you start crying. What's wrong with you? And I couldn't believe what was happening on the inside of me. I'm like, what is going on? I mean, what's happening? I just feel like and then you're loving people and I'm hugging people and, and say, hey, man, brother, I love you, man. Give me a hug, man. And I'm looking around and I'm saying, what is going on, man? What is going on? And then I started to realize what was happening. And I said, you know what? I gotta, I can't fight that. Most some people fight it. I'm from Oakland, man. Don't talk to me like that. <laughs> like, we know you're from Oakland, but you a Christian now. You ain't gotta be so tough. Let the Spirit of God have his way. Ain't nobody going to talk to me like that. I'm a grown man. You know? And then we get, we did, we're trying to hang on to the old you. But if you want to hang on to the old you, you're going to hang on to that condemnation too. You're going to hang on to that condemnation. Because there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh. But according to who? The spirit. And the Spirit of God is going to start moving in you, and you'll find yourself becoming something new from the inside out. Embrace it. Don't fight it. Embrace it. Don't fight it. Because what the law cannot do through the flesh, and that it was weak towards the flesh, Christ did. He's already had the earth and experience. He's causing you to have one his way. You're going to overcome this. You're going to resist the devil. You're going to deny yourself. You're going to tell yourself no. You're going to walk away from a good business deal, but it looked like a good business deal, but it was a trap from the devil. You're going to walk away from it. You're going to walk away from a relationship that you know you need to walk away from. You're going to get connected with this person and that person, and you're going to start going, man, you're going to get rid of some of that worldly music that you was listening to that was poisoning your brain and causing you to cuss and fuss and act a fool, and you're going to start listening to some worship music that's going to magnify God and, and lift him up, and it's going to cause your house to be filled with the presence of God. You're going to start giving away stuff, and then you're going to start grabbing a hold of some stuff that's going to start changing, and your friends are going to look at you and say, man, you crazy. Crazy, what happened to you? Man, you used to be the life of the party. But you, you tell them now, yeah, I'm still partying. I'm partying for Jesus. I don't have to be partying with the way y'all partying. And I can wake up in the morning, I don't have a hangover. And wondering who I'm sleeping next to. <laughs> y'all know I'm telling the truth. I'm in this place. Y'all know I'm, But what happens is... When you get the condemnation, and then the condemnation starts lifting, and you start getting that condemnation, then you don't need all this stuff to try to make yourself feel better. Look what he says. Verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On behalf, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirements of the law, the law of Moses, might be fulfilled in who, y'all? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to who, y'all? The spirit. So now you fulfilling, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. The righteous requirements of the law are now fulfilled in us by nature and not by willpower. 
If you are trying to fulfill the rights requirements of the law in your own strength, you're going to fail. If you yield to Christ and the Christ who's already overcame starts to move in your life, then by nature you'll just stop doing the things that Christ is condemned. It just starts to flow out of you. You're not trying to remember not to cuss. God has just changed your heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So now it just comes out of your spirit now. You're not always trying to remember not to do it. It's just your nature not to do it. I don't cuss. I don't lie. You're not always having to have this inner struggle, but you just yield to the Spirit of God. And now, if the Holy Spirit is in you, who is the Spirit of truth, then truth is going to come out of you. And if you did happen to lie, you are, uh uh-oh, that was a lie. Lord, I pray that you would forgive me for that right now. In the name of Jesus, I did not tell the truth. I asked you to wash me, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That wasn't right, Lord. I just pray that you would just continue to work on me. I'm on this part as well. I know I'm not perfect yet, but I know you're working on me. I'm still just trying to get this thing right. I just got started in this thing, man. It's kind of hard. It's a little different than I'm used to. I'm just used to just saying what I'm doing, what I want to do. But Lord, you're purging me. You're cleansing me. You're healing me. You're delivering me. You're washing me. You're cleansing me. You're helping me to become more like you. And I'm just every day. I'm just going to stay on the potter's will. I'm not going to run from it. I'm not going to run from it. I'm going to run to it because I want to walk in the truth. I'm coming to the light. I'm not running to the darkness. I don't want to be like the old Adam who went in the, and hid himself. I want to be open. Just, Lord, cleanse me, wash me, purge me. I need help. I need God. I need you to do something in my life. God, move in my spirit. Change my heart. That's how you start talking to God. Amen. But what happens is when you do that, condemnation just starts lifting off you. It starts lifting off of you. He says in verse 4, For the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Look at verse 5. He says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, this is so critical because it is it is a is a tool that we need to help us in the process it is about your mindset where is your mindset is your if your mind is just set on the things of the flesh if your mind is just set on the things of this world and you and relationships and having stuff and and who's liking you on Facebook and who's doing this. If your mind is just set on that, then it's going to ultimately lead to death. But if you're if you set your mind on the things of the spirit, it's going to lead to life and peace. Who wants life and peace in this room right here? I want life and peace. So I have to make sure that my mind is set. And when I wrote this down. I, I just, uh, it, it just, it's so important that we see that, you know, a person's mind is set typically on the things that they place value on. What do you value? What are your values? In order to change your mindset, we have to change our value system. Okay, is if your value systems all around all revolve around just sex and lust, then what happens is that's what you're going to be thinking about all the time, and it's going to set your mind in the wrong place, and ultimately it's going to lead to to death. You, we have to learn how to reset our minds. You may be coming, you may be in this room right now, you're coming off the street, and this is the stuff that you're dealing with. Well, here God is trying to tell you and I, you got to change your, you got to change your value system. You change your values. Let me say this, let me say this about sex. You know the problem with sex is, is people, 
people don't understand how beautiful sex really is. Sex is not, it's not just a, a, an, a relieving of your sexual, I mean, your gratifications. That's the problem that we have with sex, and that's the, that's the, the, the devil, he's good at what he does. He perverts things that God is meant to be beautiful. And that's the problem. People look at sex, and it's all about self-gratification. It's about me being satisfied. They don't see it as a husband shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. Right? The two shall become one. You're one. You're one spiritually. God makes you one with that person's spirit because you're married to somebody, and in the Lord, and hopefully both people are saved, what happens is you both have the same spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you. Number two, when a person has sex with somebody, their souls become tied. So now you have a soul tie, okay? Number three, when a person has sex with somebody, the two in that moment are becoming what? And there is a celebration. It is a celebration of your union with this person. Having sex is a celebration of your union. It should be a rejoicing. It is a rejoicing and a celebration that we have become one. And God is in the midst of you all becoming one. And he celebrates you being one. But if you just scrolling through Instagram and you want to sleep with this girl because she got a big butt, I'm preaching the truth. I'm, hey, listen. I'm preaching the truth today. We're going to get free up in here. People are going to get free. I mean, you go to another church, they may not talk like that. I'm telling y'all the real. Can I have an amen? amen? And if that's the only thing on your mind, you don't understand sex. But how many people, this is what's going on in the world. It's what's going on in the world, and people are having sex. And then we have having sexual transmitted diseases. And then we have having babies out of wedlock. And then we have having this and that. And then we look up and the world is all messed up and the divorce rate is the way it is. And people are saying, I don't know how this happened. <laughs> can I have an amen, y'all? And I'm saying, can, can we allow God's definition of sex to come back in the church and back in society and back in the life so we're not just sleeping around with everybody and then messing up and then having soul ties, having to break stuff and having five, ten baby daddies and my be mama, and then we're running around. What happened? But when we see here, when we look here, when God brings two people together, it should be a celebration. We have to start seeing sex the right way. And what happens with people is when God brings up two people together, what God joins, he's joining them. We don't look at sex through the lens. And this is the reason why God told, tells us not to fornicate because you're tying yourself to all these people. Soul ties are real. You, 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 haven't, you haven't slept with that person in 15 years, and all of a sudden that person will pop up in your head. That's why we got to, in this church, we believe in breaking soul ties. Can I have an amen, y'all? We got to break them soul ties and make sure people, David said this. I don't know why I'm on this. David said it. It's not in my notes. David said this. David said this. And he restores my soul. Look at somebody and tell them, wow. <laughs> we got to get some souls restored. We're going to have an altar call for some, some souls restored this morning. He says, and he restores my soul. My soul has been out of joint. I got all these concubines. I got all this stuff I've been messing with. But God, how many know, God can come in and restore your soul. 
And so what happens is we have to stop letting the devil redefine those things that are beautiful, and we have to reclaim them and realize this, is, this should be a celebration. So I shouldn't be on here looking at this stuff and fantasizing and looking at pornos and filth and all this stuff. I'm not giving myself to that stuff. God has a beautiful plan for sex and matrimony and all that other stuff. i got to align myself with that. And then I'm going to lift that condemnation off of my life. Then I'm going to lift the shame off of my life. He says here, verse 4 again. He's, no, let's look at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds. So God has to come in and reprioritize And he has to change our values and help us to understand and place things in their proper place and context so that we really can enjoy and our mind is set right. I don't don't just look at your look at your spouse and only thing you're thinking about is sex. Reset your mind. Because let me say this. You marry a woman or you marry a man in their 20s. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> when, 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 your, when your spouse gets 50, when your spouse gets 60, when your spouse gets 70, when they get 80, they're not going to look like when they was 20. And you're not going to look like you was when you were 20. And so you're going to have to have something more in your relationship. Can I have an amen? So understand here in verse, in verse 5 that we set our minds the right, we got to prioritize right. Those things that we prioritize and we value, those are the things that generally we set our minds on. Allow God to change that within all of us. Lord, change that within all of us so that the things of the Spirit, we're more con- concerned and consumed with them than the things of the flesh. And we don't allow the world to impose its value system and mindset upon us as the people of God. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is what, y'all, but to be spiritually minded is what? Life. I want my mind, I want to be spiritually minded. The Holy Spirit is coming to my life. And my mind, my will, and my emotions are now subject to the Holy Spirit. And then now the Holy Spirit, and I wrote this down here, the Holy Spirit starts to wash my brain. You know, in this church, I'm not, I'm not afraid to use the term brainwashed. Our brains need to be washed. All the stinking thinking that we had in our lives... God, come through your word and wash our minds with the washing of water by the word of God and purify my thoughts and purify my mind and purify my desires and my, and my imagination and my views concerning things. Wash the things, cleanse me, and help me to begin to think the right way. God wants to come in and wash our minds and cleanse our minds. And so here... He says, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's when the life and peace comes. And then what happens? The condemnation is just lifted. The condemnation has no place to land on you. It has no place to land when we allow God to wash our minds and to make us spiritual, spiritually minded. Because verse 7 says, the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So within a person who does not know the Lord, 
the Bible says that there's enmity against God. In the person's thoughts, they reject God. I don't receive that. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't receive religious things. They're not acceptable of religious things. As long as the religious things do not come along to try to change their view about things. Some people will come to church, but just don't try to tell me to change my lifestyle. Just give me a nice, warm, fuzzy message that's going to make me feel good, and I feel better about myself. Right? Right? But what happens here is we have to see that when it comes to our relationship with God, there, the condemnation is already there because there's also enmity between us and God. God lifts that off as we walk in the Spirit and as we get in Christ. He frees us from that, and he helps us to see that, um, that there is a difference now. I'm not opposed to the things I used to be opposed to when I come into the house of God. This is what I mean by that. There are times when I would go to church before I knew the Lord, and I would sit there, and the preacher would be be preaching. He'd be preaching against something, and, you know, I could feel the excitement and everything like that. And then he said, well, you know, you got to stop doing this, and you got to stop. God doesn't want you doing that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There's nothing wrong with that. You tripping. Girl, why are you inviting me to this church? <laughs> right? But it wasn't his fault. It's my fault. My heart's bad. And it wasn't even about, you know, somebody inviting me to church. I would be, I would go to Grace Temple. Missionary Baptist Church in Lompoc, California. And I would sit right there. I knew everybody. It was their family. I grew up with these people. And I would sit there preaching. And I... (laughs) Why? Because there's enmity between me and God. Not in terms of my confession. Oh, I believe in God. There's nothing wrong with God. God. Oh, yeah, God's been good to me. I had no problem. But there's enmity in that you're trying to tell. Now, if God's trying to tell me to do something that I'm not trying to do, now we got a problem. We got a problem. And generally, and this is the reason why sometimes sometimes a thought comes to my, my mind, you know, retire and get out of here. But I don't do it because I know, because I know. I know I didn't make this stuff up. I'm just a messenger, y'all. Y'all can get mad at me. I didn't write it. I don't take it personal. The devil tries to just get mad and get out of it. No, I'm not getting mad. Shut up, devil. Um, but I, I say, but sometimes in my mind, I'm like, why do people are blaming me? I didn't write this right here. All I'm doing is communicating what God said. I don't like that pastor. He tripping. He don't take it up with me, man. Take it up with who, y'all? God. Take it up with God. I don't take it personal, so you can say what you want. I don't care. He says here, so then, look at verse 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Look at verses 9 and 10. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. There's an if there, though. Y'all see it? If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And so we, when we give our life to God, God releases his Spirit into our lives. He infuses within us the divine nature, and he causes us to live an overcoming lifestyle. It keeps condemnation over, away from us, and then we start to detox from the world, and we start to live a lifestyle that pleases him from the inside out. We become a reflection of our Father. And 
We have to understand that there is a process taking place and going on, but we have to fully embrace it and come to the light. Don't hide your sin. Don't hide your sin. Bring it to the light and then allow the Holy Spirit to come forth, wash you, cleanse you, empower you, and then lift any guilt and shame off of your life. He says in verse 10, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. Your old nature, but the spirit is life because of what? Righteousness. So I don't let let the old me um, get the best of me and overtake me anymore. It's lost its power through Christ and his infusing of his nature and his spirit within me. So this becomes your lifestyle. It becomes... And then you learn to become comfortable with that, becomes a part of who you are. And now you start to live out the realities of this. And the the power that your old nature had, now it starts to slip away from from it. It, The power starts to, the, the old nature starts saying, no, but come back. And you say, no, you're dead. You're dead. You're dying every day. Every day I'm denying you. No, come on. Eat that cupcake. We had 10 last week. Let's have 10 more. No, no, no. Oh, no, I didn't hit so I didn't hit a chord now. I didn't hit a chord now. You gotta tell your flesh, no, you ain't having the kick the cupcakes. Your flesh is saying. Come back! I want the cupcakes, the chocolate ones! You have to tell your flesh no. You learn to tell yourself no with things. You learn to say no to the old Jew. Cuss them out. Go ahead, get them. And then the devil, he's egging you on too. He's sitting on your shoulder saying, yeah, listen to your flesh. Right? Get bitter. Get angered. Angry, get emotional, get, get out of whack. Come on, just come on. <laughs> and you learn to live a lifestyle understanding this dynamic within you, and, and you know how to shut the old you down. Now watch this. The more, the, 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 the less that you feed the old you, the quicker it's going to die. The more you feed the new you, the, the more he's going to grow and live. The more you set your mind on the things of the spirit, the things of the flesh are going to begin to die in your life. And if, and if Christ, look at verse 10, is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of what y'all righteous. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells where, y'all? In you. That I am a host of the Holy Ghost. Whoo! I am a host of the Holy Ghost. And that the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead, he lives on the inside of me. And I am alive in Christ, and I have a new nature. Old things have passed away, and old things have become, uh, all things have become new. That God has delivered me. God is eradicating from my life every evil and unclean spirit. And he is infusing me with the power of his spirit. And he becomes a guardian of the house. Well, saints, what we got to do is learn to rest in this. And as this is happening, then the guilt and the shame, it starts to become distant in your life. And you can look in the mirror and say, I'm a child of God. That I am, I am, I am beloved and the king is my father. That I have a new nature and I have the right, renew. David said, re, re, restore to me, what he said, renewing me the right kind of spirit. Renewing me the right spirit. He understood that a bad spirit had got into his life. 
But I need renewal. Well, this is what happens. God starts to release his spirit in your life. And then these, spirit, these uh, scriptures become such a reality to you. And you start living your life that way. You're not faking it. It's just who you've become. You're not faking it. It's just now a part of your nature. And you're not faking it. It's just your lifestyle. You're not faking it. It's just who you're drawn to. You're not faking it when it comes to relationships. You know who, how to cut somebody off and how to add somebody based on what you know to be true. And let me say this to you ladies. You ladies, if you're trying to find, if you have a desire to be married, that is an awesome thing. I applaud it, and I think you should. There's nothing wrong with that. Some people may say, well, I don't want to be married. That's the blessing too. But if you desire to be married, find somebody that got the same spirit as you. Find somebody that you can say, in your mind, I can see my soul being tied to that person. Find somebody that you can say, I could be one with that person and God will celebrate over this union. Can I have an amen? amen. What, what, you, you start to, when you start living like this, every little thing like this matters. I'm going to find the right job for me. I'm going to find the right the right friends to hang out. I'm going to find the right, who is God leading me to? And, and it becomes your lifestyle. And then what happens? The guilt begins to lift off your life. Then you, look in, you can look yourself in the mirror and say, whom the Son is set free. Is what, y'all? Free. Can I have an amen? Do I have any free people up in this church this morning? Do I have some people in here that know how to get the condemnation out of your life? Do I have some people in here that know how to tell the devil to shut up and tell God to reign in your life? Come on, everybody stand to your feet. Every now and then, you're going to find in your life, no matter how far you've journeyed with God, that the devil is going to try to remind you of your past. Now with social media and technology, all the things that go on in life, you can, people can contact you that you wish had left the planet. <laughs> all this stuff is accessible. Your past, is, it, your past can come and try to haunt you. Take these scriptures and meditate on them. Get them in your spirit so that you know how to combat the enemy when he tries to remind you of your past. There is therefore now. There wasn't before. People were condemned. Held enslaved into their sin and in bondage and the guilt and the shame of their past and, conde and condemned. But he says there is therefore now no condemnation. Now, because you're in Christ Jesus and because you don't walk in the flesh, condemnation doesn't have a right to stay in your life. So when you're at your house all by yourself and the devil starts trying to play with your mind, know how to fight back. Can I have an amen, y'all? Know how to fight back. I'm not going to let you win. It's unlawful for you to get this in my mind anymore. It is against the law of the life, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus for you to condemn me. Because my life is in Christ. And I don't walk in the flesh. You have no right to stay here. You have no right in my home. You have no right in my, in my singleness. You have no right in my marriage. You have no right on my job. The, spirit of, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. You don't have a right. And so when the devil starts telling you that, you start using the word as a tool. And then you start reminding him of his future. You know you're going to the lake of fire, right? 
You know your demons is going to the lake of fire, right? You remind them, I know your future. You can't, you can't erase it either. It's already written. You, you know you're going to the lake of fire. You don't play around here. Don't play with me. Because I, I know my rights. I know my rights. Can I have an amen? I know my rights. Can I have an amen, y'all? You better, you better know your rights. You better get in this book and know your rights. And when you do this, you watch that condemnation lift off of you. And you, you. and you just receive all the joy and the love and the peace and the redemption and the restoration and the healing and the deliverance that God has for your life. And you walk down the street, go tiptoeing through the tulips sometimes. Tell yourself, man, this sure does feel good to be free and without any condemnation or guilt and shame on my life. Father, we thank you this morning for what you have done in sending your son to die for us. The incorruptible seed, the incorruptible seed that was placed in Mary that came out as sinless perfection. That was the price that was paid. That was the price that was necessary. And we thank you that he is now Jesus. You are our kinsman redeemer. You know what it feels like to be in this earthen shell. And you know what it means to overcome it. Continue to overcome it in and through us every day. As we deny ourselves, we take up our cross and we follow you. We are not condemned. We are not condemned. The world who has rejected Christ is condemned already. But we are no longer under the condemnation because of what you have done for us, Jesus. We thank you for your power. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your nature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Can we shout a praise for that this morning? I'm happy. Man, I'm so happy about that. Man, I'm so happy I can run through this church. If you're in this room this morning and you're saying, Pastor, I needed to hear this message. This is just what I need. I want you to come down the altar. Let us pray and touch and agree with you and ask God just to continue to do his, what he's doing in his process in your life. You may be saying to yourself this morning, Pastor Kaufman, I'm not saved. I want to be saved. I want this in my life. Come on down to this altar and watch what God will do for you. God wants to take you and give you a fresh start. Today is a day that you receive your fresh start. Come on down. Look at all these young people down here on this altar. Come on, altar workers. Come on, let's find some people and let's pray and believe God. And whoever else wants to come down, you come, to, come on down to this altar. Don't let the devil stop you from coming down here and getting the breakthrough and the restoration and healing that God's trying to do in your life. Come on down to the altar. Come on, altar workers. Let's find them. God bless you for tuning in. We'll see y'all next week. Come on, y'all. Come on. Come on, let's find somebody. Elder Mike.